Let's now shift our focus to Europe, where Russia's superior war machinery continues to make the NATO's eastern flank members very, very nervous. And as a result, six NATO countries are joining forces to build a so-called drone wall to protect their borders. You heard that right. The NATO states along the US-led bloc's eastern flank are preparing to bolster their protection against what they termed unfriendly countries. And this is going to be done using drones. Announcing the decision on Friday, Lithuania's interior minister, Agne Belotet, said that the move comes at a time when the world is witnessing a rapid pace of drone development fed by the war in Ukraine. As per reports, the drone wall in the works is expected to add to physical barriers and surveillance systems. And it does not stop at drones. The NATO members bordering Russia in Europe are also beefing up their borders with fortifications, hubs and telecommunication systems. The other NATO states taking part are Lithuania's Baltic neighbours, Latvia and Estonia, as well as Poland, Finland and Norway. Details such as funding, the timeline, the technical aspects of the project are not clear at the moment, but reports say that the European Union funds could play a role. In fact, reports also suggested that each NATO country had to do its homework. Apart from coordinating with other NATO allies, each country has been focused on boosting its border infra. The six countries taking part in the drone wall project met in the Latvian capital last week. They discussed security threats as well as the issue of non-military tactics like instrumentalized migration, citing past instances where Russia or its ally Belarus sent masses of undocumented asylum seekers from Africa and West Asia over their borders. More than two years of the war in Ukraine has spurred lightning-fast innovations in airborne, land-based, waterborne drones. Since the war in Ukraine started two years ago, NATO nations bordering Russia have worried that they could be the next target after all. Their efforts at ramping up defences at the border are driven by fears that the Baltic Sea could become Putin's playground from where he can terrorise other members of the NATO. Finland, for that matter, which joined the NATO in 2023, shares an 832-mile border with Russia. They have accused Russia of weaponizing migration against the Nordic nation. Of course, Russia denies this claim, but the Finnish government fears what it calls a hybrid attack by Russia. They say it could restart at any moment. Finland, by the way, has a conscription army, meaning military service is compulsory for men. And as part of its efforts to safeguard its border, Finland plans to change those rules so as to allow thousands of reservists to help patrol its border with Russia. Meanwhile, Poland, last week, Poland signed an agreement with the US for the delivery of a $960 million airspace reconnaissance system. The system basically will help Poland monitor its, monitor its northeastern borders. And this means that Poland will be the second country in the world to use this system. The country has also boosted defence spending this year to about 4% of the GDP. Its goal, like other nervous members of the NATO, is to strengthen its armed forces following Russia's invasion of Ukraine. And as part of its efforts, Poland will receive four aerostats or mood balloons which will be stationed at posts along the eastern and northeastern borders of Poland, assisting Poland's air defence system as well as the coastal observation system. Radar suspended from the balloons will monitor the sky as far as Ukraine, Belarus and the Russian enclave of Kaliningrad. From the Polish airspace, they have the ability to detect a wide range of objects, by the way, like missiles, aircraft, drones, as well as surface vessels in a range of over 300 kilometers. Meanwhile, Lithuania State Border Guard Service also has a new drone unit. They are currently building up stocks of drones as well as counter drone systems. All of this in preparation for a potential Russian assault. In Europe, not a week goes by without another stark warning about the growing potential of a Russian attack on one of the European countries, especially if Ukraine loses the war. But are their fears justified is the question. Will Russia really target NATO members? 
Remember, if Russia indeed attacks any one of the NATO members, it would push the US in direct confrontation with Russia, sparking a World War III. It's because the NATO follows collective defense. An attack on one is an attack on all. So does Russia really want that? Experts don't think so. Whether or not Russia will attack is superseded by a much bigger question, in fact. And in that lies the actual fear of the US-led military bloc. It is the question of whether the NATO will be able to handle Russia's superior war machinery. You see, in the past two years of the war, the Kremlin's war machinery has shown resilience. Resilience in the face of Western sanctions aimed at isolation and crippling the Russian economy. Still, even though NATO countries kept scraping at the bottom of the barrel to arm Ukraine as its own stockpile ran low, Russia continued to manufacture produce and deploy the latest weapons at a much faster pace. Ukraine just could not keep up. Hence, today it is outnumbered and outgunned on the battlefield. Two years later, Russia is showing no signs of abating. It has now, in fact, made a new push in Ukraine's Kharkiv region. And therein lies the NATO's real dilemma. Is Ukraine now NATO's pipe dream? Does it really deserve more attention after two years of the war? That's the question that is haunting the West. Time now for Gravitas Recall. It is the 27th of May and on this day back in 1964, India's first Prime Minister, Jawaharlal Nehru, passed away at the age of 74. His death anniversary is celebrated every year to honour his legacy and his achievements. Nehru played a major role in Indian politics and in forming contemporary India. He laid the foundations for several institutions and policies that guided India's growth and development. His focus on education and scientific advancement led to the establishment of premier institutions like the Indian Institutes of Technology and the Indian Institutes of Management. Nehru was also adored by children who affectionately called him Chacha Nehru. So much so that his birth anniversary, which falls on November 14, is celebrated as Children's Day every year. Tonight, our top story is about the Israeli strike on Rafah. Particularly, it's about one man's reckless, brazen and selfish pursuit of political survival. Just take a look at the pictures on your screen. This is the city of Rafah today. Do you hear that? That's a sound of pain and anguish. Over the weekend, Israel turned Rafah into hell on earth. Those are the words of the United Nations. Israel's strike on Rafah killed at least 40 people in a tent camp. Her husband and the one in her stomach. She was the only one we had. She was the only one and she was gone. She was the only one. As shocking images came out of Rafah showing mass casualties, world leaders once again condemned Israel's action, urging it to observe the Friday ruling of the International Court of Justice. Israel's military stated that Sunday's air attack was based on precise intelligence. They claimed to have eliminated two Hamas fighters. However, if the strike was based on precise intelligence, how did they manage to kill 35 civilians? Isn't the death of two Hamas operatives at the cost of 35 Palestinian lives a reckless gamble, to say the least? The attack took place in the Tel al-Sultan neighborhood where thousands were sheltering after Israeli forces began their ground offensive over two weeks ago. From the Israeli strike, more than half of the dead were women, children and elderly people. Health officials in Hamas-run Gaza saying that the death toll was likely to rise as more people caught in the blaze 
were in a critical condition with severe burns. By daylight, the camp that Israel attacked was a smoking wreckage of tents, twisted metal and charred belongings. Hospitals in Rafah, including the International Co Committee of the Red Cross Field Hospital, were unable to handle all the wounded. Some were wo moved to hospitals in Khan Yunis, which is located further north in Gaza. The UN Agency for Palestinian Refugees called the situation horrifying. In a tweet, they summed up the situation saying, and I'm quoting, Gaza is hell on earth. French President Emmanuel Macron said he was outraged over Israel's attacks. So did Germany. The EU foreign policy chief Joseph Borrell urged Israel to follow the International Court of Justice ruling. Egypt, Qatar and Saudi Arabia condemned the Israeli attack. On Monday, amid the global outcry, Israel's top military prosecutor called the airstrike very grave. She said that an investigation was underway and said that the IDF regrets any harm to civilians. Listen to this. Naturally, in a war of such scope and intensity, difficult events also happen. Some incidents, like last night's incident in Rafa, are very grave. The details of yesterday's incident are still under an investigation, which we are committed to conducting to the fullest extent. The IDF regrets any harm to non-combatants during the war. Still, despite the global outcry, Israeli tanks continued to bombard eastern as well as central areas of Rafah on Monday. Eight more people lost their lives. All this is the reckless pursuit of one man's goal. I am talking about Israel, Israel's Prime Minister, Benjamin Netanyahu. You see, in the past few weeks, two international courts, both based in The Hague, have tried to hold Israel accountable for its actions. While the top prosecutor of the International Criminal Court, ICC, has sought arrest warrants for Netanyahu, the International Court of Justice, ICJ, has ordered Israel to halt its offensive on Rafa. Decisions by both the courts have been met with fury in Israel. And Netanyahu, despite the ICJ ruling, despite international censure, despite its closest ally, the US, warning against it, Israel has continued to be reckless. As far as the lives of Palestinians are concerned, time and again, the Israeli Prime Minister has brazened it out. He called the ICC prosecutor anti-Semitic. He has flouted international rules of law. He has tried to threaten and intimidate international court. He has rejected multiple truce calls, even when Hamas accepted the last one. He has banned media organizations. He has defied Israel's only staunch ally and he has shown no signs of altering the strategy. It's a pattern of recklessness. The opinion among foreign policy experts is this, that Netanyahu's wartime decision making is mainly motivated by his personal interest of staying in power. That Netanyahu is essentially dragging out the war for as long as possible for his own political survival. And why, you may ask? You see, he knows that the moment the war comes to a halt, Israelis will focus even more resolutely on investigating the failures of October 7. They will push for early elections to vote him out of office. He knows the pressures he is facing within his own country. Families of the hostages are leading calls for a ceasefire. Since late January, Israeli citizens have been pushing for early elections and the removal of Netanyahu. And then on Sunday, opposition leader and former Israeli Prime Minister Yair Lapid accused Netanyahu of trying to cause anarchy. This after Netanyahu's 32-year-old son shared a video that appeared to show a reservist calling for a mutiny against the country's defense minister, Yuav Gallant. The Israeli military said it was launching an investigation the incident marked a bad week for Netanyahu's government. The longer the world allows this recklessness to continue, the more the Palestinians will suffer. Netanyahu is clearly reluctant to accept any end to the war as of now, and he will continue to claim that the only way to bring back the hostages is through military pressure against Hamas in Rafah. But you see, the longer the Israeli guns roar in Gaza, the longer that goal will take to be achieved. How long then will Netanyahu be allowed to be reckless till peace is given a chance?